Okay, we are live. You know, there's a real wrong and a real right. Oh, I, think, I think everyone does know um, right that God existed. Assuming you do. Simply because they don't want I think the answer account. is actually kind of already in the, the question there. Many voices, one message. You're listening to the Christian Apologetics Podcast with over three subscribers, The Mentionables. I'm Joel Furches. I'm Caleb Johnston. And I'm Clinton J. Wilcox, Esquire. <laughs> On this episode of The Mentionables, five tips for getting your weight under control while still eating the foods you want. Psych. Yes. <laughs> We're talking about lying. Specifically, <laughs> is God a liar? And how will we know if he was? You're getting also, that Caleb and me kind of, ex- kind of excited there, Joel. <laughs> also, ever run into a situation where you find it tough to talk about something because that thing is controversial? No? Well, we have, and we're here to have tell you how it's done. But first, games! <laughs> I'm still searching yes. for an interesting games that aren't love song, worship song. <laughs> so uh, today's game is another one experimental one I'm going to try out. Is it an obscure cult fanhood video game or is an obscure cult fanhood theology book? Ooh, are are we going to cover actual cult video games in here? Because the Jehovah's Witnesses have one that, or no, uh, yes, (laughs) Jehovah's Witnesses have one that's like a blatant rip off of uh, Super Mario Brothers. You know, it's interesting because every once in a while, the uh, poor Christian, you know, complex, industrial complex will try to put out a video game. (laughs) <laughs> and it's yeah. almost fun to play just because of how uh, pathetic. I don't know. Yeah, when I when I was a kid, uh, I actually played a a video game put out by uh, by a Christian company called Wisdom Tree, and it was a blatant ripoff of uh, The Legend of Zelda. Yeah, they. I don't know if it was them. I think it might have been way back in the early '90s. They put out a Noah's Ark game where you were running around the ark trying to uh, recapture escaped animals. <laughs> and yeah. it was it was basically it was the same engine as Wolfenstein 3D, um, but just with animals instead of Nazis. Yeah, wow. I've, I've never played it, <laughs> but I, I do watch videos by the. I don't know if you heard of the Angry Video Game Nerd. Yeah, yeah. I, I I watch his videos because uh, he talks a lot about a, a lot of about a lot of the nostalgic games that I played when I was a kid. Uh, you know, oh. if you're if you're sensitive to uh, to crude jokes and uh, and and excessive swearing, this uh, is not a show yeah. you're going to be watching. Just FYI yeah. to our listeners. Um, I, <laughs> but uh, yeah, he 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 actually has a few shows where he actually covered uh, Bible games, and so. Uh, you know, I got to see some footage of that Noah Ark, Noah's Ark game, and uh, you know, a bunch of other ones that have been put out. So. Yep. I think that's yeah. where I learned about it as well. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> the only one I ever played was like, I think it was a Commodore 64, and it was like, 
you literally just had to put the Bible books in in the correct order. So it was just like a matching game on like super old machine, could hardly do anything. <laughs> like an Atari? Yeah, yeah. What are you talking about? Commodore 64 was awesome. <laughs> well, I, I, I wouldn't mind those kinds of games because those are educational. You know, put that in for your five-year-old, see if he has, you know, learned the Bible books very well. Yeah, exactly. Well, anyway, the title of this particular game kind of speaks for itself. Everybody down? Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, so I'm going to name it. You tell me if you think it's a theology book or a, a an obscure video game. And you probably have a, a distinct advantage over the audience in this in that you are probably more familiar with video games and theology books. <laughs> so if you know it, don't feel afraid of saying, uh, you know, the correct answer. Uh, we'll start yeah. with this. Search for Eden. I'm going to say that's a theology book. Okay. Ooh. Not confident in my answer. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go video game on this one. Okay. The Search for Eden is a side-scrolling action video game developed by Almanic Corporation and published by Enix for the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. It was released in 1992 for the Japanese audience. The game was later translated and released in North America in 1993. Yeah, a little bit of a video game history. Uh, Enix was actually a legit company. Uh, they, uh, they uh, at a later time, they merged with uh, with a company called Squaresoft to become Square Enix. Squaresoft, of course, being the company that made the Final Fantasy games. Yeah. And so Square Enix took over the Final Fantasy games when Squaresoft and Enix merged. Okay. So, Next yeah. one. A, ra- a Racing Hell. I'm going to say that's a theology book. Yeah, okay. that one that one is a theology book. Yeah, it's a 2011 book by Francis Chan about the nature or existence of hell. Mm. All right. Yeah, yeah next kinda, one. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Next I one. Yeah, I, just, I was just going to say, I was, I was kind of, yeah, I was, it's kind of an educated guess because I, I've been talking to a lot of people uh, who have become like conditionalists regarding hell. And I'm thinking, oh, maybe that's a, maybe that's a theology book about, about the nature of hell or something. So, yeah. 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 That one's shown up in my Amazon suggested reads for a while. So. All right. Well, there you go. You, uh, are you an annihilationist? Me? Yeah. No, no, I, I believe in eternal conscious torment. Okay. And, you know, uh, the, the torment part isn't, you know, it, it's, you know, it, it, I mean, it's a whole big discussion. You know, it, it, I don't, my, the view that I hold doesn't necessitate that you're being, you know, tortured for eternity because even if uh you know even if our even if our modern concept of hell about being a place of torture is incorrect you know as others like c.s lewis have written uh hell is really more about being separated from christ than it is about any sort of uh, of punishment or torture and so so someone could be alive for eternity not tortured in like you know, a burning fire or anything like that, but tortured by the knowledge of knowing that they'll be separated from Christ for eternity, that they could have, um, if, if they'd taken, uh, you know, believers more seriously in this life, they could have attained an, an eternity with God and that kind of thing. So it's just the whole, um, or even, you know, C.S. Lewis even takes it further in that the people in hell actually want to be in hell. And so, you know, he says like the door from hell is locked from the inside. So, you know, there's even that view, but so, so the real main, I, I would say fundamental, portion of the view I hold is an eternity is an eternal uh, eternity of consciousness in hell. I don't believe in annihilation or in um, uh, whatever the other view is that everyone will be saved in the end. Ah. Or universalism or whatever it is. Yeah. All right. You know, I've been sitting here in my head and debating on whether we should just go ahead and talk about hell for a little while. Oh. <laughs> but uh, I've decided not to just so we right. can, you know, finish the game. Okay. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> But right, I think we one. found another podcast topic at some point. Oh, yeah, yeah. That could be a series right there. Right. Actually, that's not a bad idea. We could each present on a different view. But yeah, for a later date. Okay. All right. Next one. Yeah. Shattered Visage. I'm going to say video game. Okay. I'm going to go theology book. All right. Shattered Visage is a 1990 uh, book by Ravi Zacharias about the topic of atheism. 
Caleb is obviously better at this game. Let's let's go back to the uh, love song worship. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got right. a little bit lucky on that one. I I picked that one up at, at a Goodwill about five years ago. Oh, okay. oh, okay. All right. Okay. Next one. Dante's Inferno. <laughs> That's the, uh, is this a trick question? It's a book in the game, isn't it? Yes, it is. <laughs> that one seemed a little too obvious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. New trick question. Sure. Yeah, I knew for sure it was a book, but I suspected it was a trick question. So, yeah. Yeah, okay. trick question. Uh, it's a 1320 book by Dante L. Jerry. Oh, mm-hmm. a league. I don't know. I'm not going to try it. <laughs> I, Gary. I don't know if my pronunciation is correct or not. Yeah. But it's also a 2010 third person action game, um, which is my, it has the exact same model of Devil May Cry. Okay, so yeah. it's, it's a Dev- Devil May Cry ripoff. Uh. Okay, Except yeah. that entirely in hell. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right, yeah. It's, a, it's actually follows the plot of the book. You just accept instead of like journeying through hell, he's fighting through hell. Uh, right. Yeah. yeah uh, I tried playing Resident, Resident Evil once. Uh, I cannot play horror video games. <laughs> I just can't do it. It's, it's too, it, it, it makes me too, too anxious to, to, <laughs> to play them. Oh, yeah. We're going to, we're going to put you through uh, Outlast then. Oh, that, that well, one's uh, that one's been a little rough for me. Even when I try that one out, yeah, man. yeah. All right, Act Razor. Uh, that one is a video game. Okay. Narrow. Hmm. <laughs> well, Clinton's confident, so I'm just going to follow his lead on this one. <laughs> Sorry, I probably shouldn't let you answer this one. <laughs> All right, Actraiser is a 1990 platforming and city building simulator for the Super Nintendo. Yes, I've never played it, but I have definitely heard of it. Okay. How about Demon's Crest? I'm going to go video game on this one again. Okay. I'm going to go video game also, not confident. All right. I guess. Demon's Crest is a 1994 side scrolling platforming video game developed and published by Capcom for Super Nintendo. Oh, Capcom's a legit company too. They do the uh, Mega Man games and, you know. Well, when I said that they had a cult following, I didn't mean that they were made by obscure. Yeah, that, that's what I figured. I figured you didn't mean cult in like uh, religious cults, just like they have a cult following. That, that's kind of what I figured. Yeah. All right. They're, they're little known games or books that have. A group of people that really enjoy them. Right. How about that? Yeah. All right. The Crook in the Lot. Okay. Yeah. The Crook uh, in the Lot. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm going to say I'm gonna theology go, book. Huh? Oh, yeah, good, I'm good. Good. Oh, I'm going to go theology book as well. Okay. The Crook in the Lot is an 1841 book by Thomas Boston about the problem of suffering and the sovereignty of God. Yeah, 1841, you need to stop there. It's definitely not a video game. <laughs> <laughs> you never heard of the 1841 Atari? No, I, I never heard of I never heard of that uh, ancient predecessor to the modern uh, gaming systems. That's All called right, that's... throwing rocks at villagers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, true. fun stuff. Good times. <laughs> yeah. Right. This is the good old days. Mm. Have ever either of you ever read the uh, short story "The Lottery"? No, I can't say that I have. All right, it's one of those like short stories that was popular that you know has this like really disturbing twist at the end. Mm. You know, kind of like an Edgar Allan Poe type thing. <laughs> but I won't talk of it. it. It's basically it's throwing rocks at villagers. Yeah, oh. <laughs> that's why it, it came to mind. <laughs> well, I'm going to be uh, reading that tonight, then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, I, I told uh, Joel this because I, I saw him recently when I went to Maryland a couple weeks ago. Um, that uh, I actually recently picked up a collection of poems and short stories by Edgar Allan Poe. It's got everything he's ever written. Oh, that's so, very cool. Look, looking forward to reading through that. Have you ever read the Horror Law? No, I haven't. Okay. It was it was something I had read to me when I was a child, and for all of my life I thought it was written by Edgar Allan Poe, and I was so disturbed that I'd never been able to find it again. Mm-hmm. Um, basically, the plot was that there's this guy that you know wakes up one morning, and as he goes through his daily routine, he lives by himself. He starts to realize there's this sort of invisible creature 
that's following him around and living in his apartment and things like that, but he can't prove it to anyone. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it, it details why he thinks there's an invisible creature that's around. But, um, you know, the, the question is, is he going crazy or is there really an actual invisible creature? So it was very Poe-esque, but it wasn't Poe. Turns out it was, you know, totally different author, which is why I couldn't find it for years. Oh, yeah. Well, anyway. at least at the very least, we've given uh, listeners some good short story recommendations. Yeah, definitely. Very, you know, Christian-y, theologically. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, read read some classics, fellas. Don't just stick to the uh, theology stuff. You can read yeah. outside the Bible. Right. I'm not yeah, one that, of those guys. Yeah, that was something that um, Tim McGrew really drove into us at the uh, New Orleans conference I was at a few weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tim McGrew is our presenting, and he was really uh, kind of hammering home the uh, – not necessarily just the necessity, but the importance of uh, of reading ancient works, because a lot of the critiques that we hear of Christianity today are not new, and they were addressed in the, in the ancient times by you know thinkers like William Paley and uh, and others. And so, yeah, so you know, and you'll see a lot of uh, arguments that have kind of fallen out of popularity, even though they're still good arguments uh, if you read those books. So, yeah, uh, he was very much adamant on on reading the classics uh, among uh, Christian apologetics. So. McGrew's good people. He is. He is. And uh, since and, we're talking about other apologists, why don't you tell us about a little uh, guy named Greg Kokel and what he's written recently? Oh, sure. Actually, I was just going to, just going to comment too, that I, I actually got to sit in uh, at a talk that Lydia McGrew gave uh, Tim's wife. And Lydia yeah. is very, very smart. Like she's very bright. Uh, yeah. I was very, very impressed by, by her presentation. I've I've hung with uh, Tim, but I've never met Lydia. Okay, a yeah, little jealous. She's uh, um, t- Tim and Lydia are are pretty pretty uh like you know Tim's really tall and Lydia uh-huh. is a lot shorter than I was expecting uh, when uh-huh. I started in person. So there's a little bit of a of a size uh, differential there, but she's she's really really bright. Uh, and Tim makes them work together. Yeah, it, right, exactly. Yeah, and Tim, of course, is no slouch either when it comes to philosophy and theology. And well, since here. we've we've got watchers slash listeners, why don't you just go ahead and uh, tell us a little bit about Tim and Lydia to you know cue our audience into the okay. loop? Well, sure. Um, I'm not you know incredibly uh, familiar with their work. Um, I do know that uh, Tim McGrew uh, is a philosopher. He's an epistemologist. He's done work in epistemology mm-hmm. uh, and he's, he's he, you know he's he does work that other philosophers have interacted with in the field of epistemology. Mm-hmm. So if, if you so when he says something you know something like uh, you know philosophers think of knowledge as as a justified true belief and then you bring up the Gettier problem well, Tim has a response to you uh, mm-hmm. because, you know, he's done academic work uh, among that. And I think he's probably done some work. Uh, well, yeah, he does uh, work in mathematics, too. He, he's done some work regarding Bayes' theorem and things like that. Well, Tim uh, is also, I'm going to jump in real quick. He's sure. also a uh, an excellent uh, historian and New Testament scholar. Mm-hmm. Um, he, I, I, re- I collaborated with him heavily as I was uh, writing my book. Mm-hmm. Um, because, you know, I needed to get his input on things like the uh, um, undesigned coincidence argument mm-hmm. and uh, some of the scholarship, you know, some of the criticisms of the book yeah. of Luke, for instance. Um, yeah. So I don't know, like, how much of a New Testament scholar he is. Like I said, I'm not incredibly familiar with his work. Like, I'm not intimately familiar with it. But he's mm-hmm. definitely very well educated, uh, very intelligent. And yeah, he, he knows a lot about New Testament scholarship, even if he's not necessarily an expert, which I, I don't know if he is or not. Mm-hmm. Uh, his wife, Lydia, has done a lot of work on undesigned coincidences. In fact, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. uh, I actually picked up a book that she wrote at the, uh, you know, uh, when I was at the conference. Uh, yeah. She had a book there. Uh, on undesigned coincidences. I've got it around here somewhere. Uh, I don't exactly remember. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. I don't remember where I put it. It's around here somewhere. But it's on undesigned coincidences. And so I'm really looking forward to reading it because that's an argument that I haven't looked into very much. So that, that'll be an, an education for me is is on this this uh, way to justify the Gospels as historically reliable in the way that they uh, that they are not just compatible, but actually uh, support the stories that they talk about because they have, you know, uh, certain facts in one gospel uh, that kind of supports a story from a different gospel because of the certain facts that it relates. And and I I find it a very interesting argument. So I'm looking forward to learning more about that. Um, And they're also, uh, uh, Tim is also an excellent chess player. 
Uh, he's, taught <laughs> yeah. his, he's taught his daughters very well. I have not actually witnessed this, but I've heard stories from people who have actually lost playing chess to one of his daughters who actually played against him blindfolded. So, oh, wow. Yeah, I, I suck at chess, so I, I would not want to take on, uh, you know, I would not want to take on him without a blindfold, but I wouldn't want to take yeah. on one of his daughters with a blindfold. Wow, so, that's that's incredible. Yeah. So, well. All right. So, yeah. So so we can we can move from Tim and Lydia McGrew on to Gregory Kokel. Well, yep. chess uh, is a is a great turning point because uh you know oh, the book the book's design is is kind of yep. a chess board and yeah. uh you know the whole word tactics is kind of a play on you know strategic yep. and, moves yep. and when and, he said turning point he meant segue right yeah exactly <laughs> yeah, yeah it, has, it, has a, it has a white one right here as the eye in tactics so yeah that is actually a very good uh uh transition into or segue, if you will. Into, Transitions also uh, is a synonym for segue, so you're right. Good. Yes. Thank you. Uh, into Greg Kokel and his book Tactics. Uh, so Greg Kokel is uh, is a, a person. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa! Slow down. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I, w- I was just trying to stall a little bit so I could grab the back of his book, and uh, so he has a degree in apologetics and philosophy, an in, in MA degree in both of those fields. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure where he went to, where he went to college. It's probably Biola or, or something like that. But yeah, so he has a degree in apologetics and philosophy and he leads an organization called Stand to Reason, which is an organization that's actually over here in my neck of the woods in California, although they're in Southern California. So it's about a four hour drive to get to where STR is headquartered from where I live. But uh, they're in, uh, I believe they're in Los Angeles, California. And they're basically just an apologetics educational organization. And uh, Greg wrote a book called Tactics uh, 10 years ago. And so just this last year, he decided for the 10th anniversary, he would release an updated edition, which contains uh, some more tactics that he's that he's uh, conceived of and some more examples of his tactics in action. And so the, the purpose of the book essentially is to help uh, is to help Christians in general, although you can really apply it to any uh, controversial topic, but it's to help Christians uh, be able to defend their views with uh, with knowledge and with grace. And so basically to have discussions on controversial topics while remaining civil, uh, but also to help you stay in the driver's seat of the conversation so that you're not constantly feeling pressured or um or anxious about about these uh, these discussions, but it helps you kind of uh, remain in the driver's seat of the conversation and steer the conversation where it needs to go. So you can, uh, you know, not he, he does not advocate being deceptive or uh, in, or in any way, you know, slimy about the discussions. He says uh, that we we really need to make sure we're focused on what the central issue is of the topic that we're discussing and make sure we don't get drawn away into various rabbit trails or anything. Like that, so we need to make sure that we keep the the topic of the dis- of the discussion on track, and he can do that by incorporating these these tactics that he's conceived of in order to kind of keep the conversation flowing the way that the way that you needed to, in order to keep the conversation on track. Okay, and, and I'll say that for me, uh, when I stumbled on tactics back, it's probably eight or nine years ago at this point that. I was in a place where I just started learning a good bit about apologetics and I knew enough that I could beat people over the head with it. Um, but I wasn't always the most gracious in how I did that. And tactics really helped. It was a turning point for me of, of taking things and, and really kind of that bridge between the apologetics and the evangelism. Mm -hmm. And, and it just makes for having great conversations with people in, in a way that, you know, any conversation that can go off the rails, um, you know, these kind of things can really save a lot of those conversations and it builds relationships along the way. Yeah. Yeah. And so if there are, 
two types of people that I would say the book tactics really helps is number one, people like Caleb who have the knowledge behind them, but, um, but beats people over the head with this knowledge, which, you know, as, as uh, someone like Greg Kokel would say, you can win the, you can win the, the debate, but lose the person. And so we really want to win the person while making good arguments. And so this well, kind of book can help. Want to do. Yeah, that is what we want to do. Exactly. So, so it can help that person uh, be a lot more persuasive in their interactions. And it can also help someone like me, someone who is not naturally outspoken, uh, someone who's just kind of timid by personality to have a lot more confidence in their conversations. Because, you know, I know a lot of the information too, but I'm not the one who wants to really go out there and just, you know, debate everybody on the topic. I'm just kind of like, yeah, if someone comes up to me and asks me, I'll, you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll respond to their questions and, you know, God, please, you know, I don't really want to talk to a lot of people because I'm kind of timid and shy. Uh, but reading through tactics has really helped me uh, have the co- the confidence that I can have in having these discussions with people. Because so you you're know, right in the corner for somebody to come up and grab you by the shoulders and say, "What is pretty, the meaning of life?" <laughs> pretty much, yeah. You know, which I'm, I'm fine answering questions, but uh, yeah, that's not you know, as we know you know, 99.99% of people aren't going to come up to you and ask you uh, questions about your faith out of the blue, unless you're wearing like some kind of like weird shirt or something or reading a book or something. And they ask, Hey, what's that about? You know, but uh, yeah. So, so this book can really help people like me too. The people who are really kind of shy and timid and don't like to, to speak out because we're afraid of, you know, afraid of offending people, afraid of how they might react. Well, that's exactly what the, the tactics in this book are geared toward helping us avoid. And if we do encounter belligerent people, like what he calls a steamroller, someone who's not interested in dialogue, but is only interested in yelling at you and only getting his point across and not listening to yours, he has tactics in here to help defuse those kinds of situations. You know, uh, certain questions you can ask uh, to try and get him to calm down uh, and, you know, just things like that, that really help, uh, you know, really help the, help build your confidence in having these conversations. All right. And, uh, and, I'll say this, um, you know, even for people who may be doubtful of, you know, maybe this isn't for me. I'll say that I've been able to take the material and teach it to my employees and my coworkers. Mm -hmm. I designed a workplace training around this because our biggest problem in my industry is communication and this just drastically improves communication between people. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, the new updated version of tactics actually mentions Peter Bogosian, who I'm Mm -hmm. sure you've both heard of. Um, You know, he's a, he's an atheist philosopher uh, who's actually kind of dishonest in his interactions with, with believers. And uh, Greg actually gives some examples of it. You know, uh, Peter Bogosian has developed a technique that he calls street epistemology, where you go out and you ask Mm -hmm. questions, but what's different about Bogosian street epistemology from Greg Kokel's uh, tactics is that he is try- is really trying to establish doubt uh, and doing it through any means necessary. Now, Greg Kokel will say, you know, we need to, we need to establish doubt in a person's position, but we also need to be able to uh, to adequately uh, defend our position and ask them questions in a way that's not combative, but in a way that really gets them to think about their views. Because if they can come to these uh, if they can come to these conclusions on their own. Uh, instead of you just kind of telling them the answer, but if they can actually come to the conclusion on their own, it's a lot more likely to stick. And so you ask questions, not, you know, not, not deceptive questions, but you ask them questions just kind of about their own views to gather information, to ask them why it is they hold those positions. And then if need be, you can gently challenge them by asking, well, have you considered that this might be the implication of your view? So, so Kokel's method is a lot, a lot more on the level than someone like uh, Bogosian's straight epistemology would be. So here's what I'll say about that. You've mm-hmm. got um, your presuppositionalist, right? And the mm-hmm. the tactic of a presuppositionalist, if they want to engage in presuppositionalist at, presuppositionalism as a tactic, is to sort of kind of question back along the line of um, somebody's thinking until you you know force them to realize there's kind of a standard standard or groundwork that they stand upon as they reason, and then you know say that, you know, in order to have that kind of ontological basis or foundation for knowledge and reason, you have to have something to stand upon. And, you know, this leads back to God. So that's, 
that's uh, presuppositionalism. Yeah, uh, this is this is not a presuppositional method. Well, fact, I'm I, I'm I'm <laughs> I'm not saying it is. I'm, I'm right. working towards a point here. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah. Well, okay. So, so go ahead. I was just... All right. So um, what Bogosian does, street epistemology. Yeah. which would be the athe- atheist counter to presuppositionalism is uh, Socratic thinking. So Socratic thinking basically just questions everything that you say in a similar fashion, but to the ultimate goal of, you know, bringing you to the conclusion that you really don't know what you're talking about, mm-hmm. that you're making uh, ungrounded su- assumptions and that, you know, you're, you're eventually uh, at some point you're, you're led to tautologies, or this idea that you're pulling your everything you say is an assertion without any kind of grounding. So it's it's very similar to uh, presuppositionalism, except you know the idea is to instill doubt, as you say. Um, yeah, and you know, I mean, Tyler's not here, so maybe I shouldn't you know badmouth presuppositionalism, <laughs> uh, but I get I get frustrated with uh, with presuppositionalists. Uh, because because of the constant like asking of why, even though I specifically explain that you know uh, there are some foundations we can hold without uh, without underlying beliefs which are properly basic, um, but you know it's, it, even Tyler does this. Uh, he tries to tell me that there's a difference between um, Van Tilian uh, Van Tilian. Uh, presuppositionalism and the type of presuppositionalism he holds, but interacting with Tyler, it seems like the exact same kind of presuppositionalism. Because you know, I've had interactions with him where he just keeps asking me, "Well, how do you know that? How do you know that?" And yeah, so that kind of thing it is very frustrating. And especially when you explain something and they just kind of dismiss it because they're they're trying to get you to to admit that you have that you're that you have a presupposition that you can't justify. Which you know, it's not the case that I can't justify it. It's just. I don't justify it in the way that, that they, that they like essentially. Um, so yeah. So, uh, so tactics is just different in that we're getting them to kind well, of, I've got think- a third point that I'm getting at. Oh, okay. Um, you can just like hold up a sign and let me know when you're done. That way I don't interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, passing back around to tactics, tactics takes some of the ideas behind Socratic and presuppositionalism, but then it mixes in a heavy dose of active listening which is sort of a therapist technique and active listening is this idea that you encourage the person to do the talking and, you know, to, to do the thinking and you, you display sort of an empathy. And that's one of the things that's built into tactics more than you would get in definitely more than you get into street epistemology is this idea that you want the person to recognize that you recognize them, you know, You want it to be an interaction with the foundation and a, you know, relationship building in addition to reasoning, uh, if you will. So, and yeah, Clinton, I don't know if you're familiar with active listening. Uh, Caleb, I know you are. Um, And Caleb, since you've also read. I'm sorry, I I wasn't listening there, Joel. Sure, sure, sure. (laughs) I'll just bulldoze on past the jokes here. Just, (laughs) all right, I've finished talking, Clinton. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. You're yeah, welcome. so yeah, because I, I I don't know if I would necessarily qualify this as a form of presuppositionalism because we're not necessarily trying to get the atheist to to recognize that they you know they have presuppositions that they're assuming. It's just we're trying to ask questions to get them to realize that they might not have a good answer for what they believe. So you know there are basically three steps for the for the question. He calls this the Columbo technique based on Detective Columbo. If you've ever seen Columbo, he comes in, he's kind of bumbling, people think he's kind of an idiot, but he keeps asking questions and through asking all of these questions he eventually kind of gets the the suspect to slip up and say something you know damning that he can you know essentially use to help solve the case and so in this case um there, there are basically three types of questions that you can ask question number one is purely for information gathering and that's um that's the question uh, you know, what do you mean by that? So if someone tells me that they're an atheist or a materialist, I would say, okay, so as a materialist, what do you kind of believe about about reality or something like that? And so there is a lot of active listening going on because you're not just asking them questions for the sake of asking questions, but you actually want them to respond so that you can know exactly what it is they believe. And you can keep asking clarification questions as much as, you know, as long as you need in order to fully understand their view because you want to be able to, uh, 
because you know, as as a lot of uh, as a lot of debaters would say, you know, you you uh, you have to be able to basically repeat the person's view back in a way that they would agree with, if you have any hope of actually responding to their concerns. And so, after you've gathered the information, number two, uh, question number two would be, uh, how did you come to that conclusion? So, like, if they say that you know, science is the ultimate authority, and there's no other authority that can give us knowledge, well, you would say, how would you, you know, how did you come to that conclusion? And then, so it's not necessarily trying to get them to see that they have no, you know, presupposition to stand or that they're only taking a presupposition, but it's just that they don't necessarily have any sort of arguments that support their views and they may not have ever considered that before. So this may be the first time you've actually ever gotten them to consider it. And so those first two questions are sometimes the only two questions you ever really need because uh, you're, you're basically just getting them to think about the fact that they haven't really thought through their position before. And so what you're doing is what Greg Kokel says, you're, you're putting a stone in their shoe, essentially. That you're getting them, you're putting something in their mind, something that they can't quite shake or get rid of something that they keep coming back to. And so, you know, the, the, the purpose of these discussions is not necessarily to make a convert right away. You just want to kind of plant seeds in, in them so that they get thinking, they go home and start researching, possibly talk to other Christians who might, uh, who might respond to them and things like that. And so, yeah, so you're, you're, you're not really aiming for a conversion right now. You're just kind of, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of sowing, you're not reaping, as we would say in, in biblical language. And then question number three could be used if you get to that point. It's just basically, you know, have you considered the implication of your views? So, you know, have you considered that if science is the only way that we can obtain actual knowledge? Well, then in that case, we can't really justify you know, moral facts. Like we can't say that uh, rape is wrong because we can't come to that conclusion scientifically. So it's just kind of a way to gently challenge their views. And so that's really, that's really the, the meat of, of the Columbo method that Greg Kokel uh, expounds in his book tactics. And then he does the road rider technique too. Uh, does he? Yeah, he doesn't have the road rider tactic. You're uh, thinking of, uh, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. Oh, is it, oh that's, 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 that's their correct. tactic. Okay, yeah. yeah, that yeah, I, I didn't, I don't remember reading that in Coco's book. <laughs> but, <laughs> Just trying yeah. to confuse everybody. Okay, yeah, one of one of the new tactics though, he calls "What a friend we have in Jesus." Oh. Um, yeah, because he he says, you know. I'll, I'll, Probably most people you talk to will respect Jesus in some respect. You know, they'll see him as a, as a good religious leader if they're Christian, or they'll see him as a good moral teacher, that kind of thing. So if someone doesn't like your view, like if they, if they're offended by your view on same sex marriage, well, you can just kind of appeal to Jesus. You know, uh, your, your argument is with Jesus. It's not with me. So, you know, what would you say then if you're talking to Jesus, you know, essentially? Um, so yeah, so that's just kind of that's just kind of the wet the appetite on one of the new techniques. But yeah, the Colombo the Colombo method is really the most important uh, the most important takeaway from the book because just in asking those questions, your conversations will uh, will basically be transformed, and you'll you'll notice a lot more uh, a lot more productivity coming from your discussions if you if you do. Yeah. So um, w- one of the things that you find when you look at atheists who eventually convert is that it's a very private experience. You don't have people sitting down with them and leading them to the Lord, although you know positive encounters with believers are always part of it as well. But you know what I'm getting at here is that this idea of putting a stone in the shoe is actually more effective than you might think because – in all of the stories of atheists that have converted to Christianity that I've looked at, at some point they have a positive encounter with a believer. Mm -hmm. So typically they'll start out with this sort of cartoonish image of Christians as being, you know, ignorant hypocrites, you know, loud mouths, I don't know, morons, all of these, you know, negative ideas of Christians. And then if a Christian shows up and breaks those kinds of, um, preconceptions that they have about the Christian and gives them the, you know, idea that perhaps Christianity isn't as stupid as I thought, then they, they, this gives them the freedom to start exploring it. And, um, you know, at some point, again, it's a personal journey. They don't have people lead them. They think it through, they do the research, they consider, and they eventually, uh, come to Christ, and you probably heard of, say, the conversion experience of C.S. Lewis, as an as a for instance. C.S. Yeah. Lewis did a lot of discussions with J.R.R. Tolkien and other members of the Inklings, and you know, at, over the course of those discussions, he came to a very personal period at which he came to you know 
recognized that perhaps Christianity was true and mm -hmm. became, you know, went from being an atheist to a Christian. And that's just a, one example, but. Right. Yeah. In fact, that's something that, that uh, we say in JFA too, justice for all. And one of the, um, one of the, uh, seminar sections that we teach is that uh, if you do successfully convert someone, it's not going to be while they're standing in front of you having this discussion where they have to save face in front of you and in mm -hmm. front of others. It's going to be two weeks down the road while they're sitting in a, in a Burger King drive through thinking back upon what you said, that's going to be the most more likely place that they're going to convert. So, you know, you can't judge your success based on how the person you're talking to you reacted. The success, especially as Christians, we judge our success by how, um, by how responsible we are with the truth and by, uh, by how well we represent Christ in our discussions. And that's how we gauge our success as Christians. See, I would not, you know, it, it seems the height of arrogance to say that you led somebody to the Lord, that you were successful because this person, you know, became a Christian. I, I reject that way of thinking. And I, you know, I think it's an arrogance that evangelists like Billy Graham and so forth have had, you know, if many, many, many people came to the Lord in his, revivals more power to him but to say that he brought them to the lord is you know the height of arrogance in my yeah. you know so and and that was a in in picking up tactics that was a big yeah, i already mentioned what a big turnaround it was for me but it was it was because of that as as a christian i felt pressure that it was it was my job to evangelize and and it certainly is but what i never saw was that i was i was viewing it as very much a job duty rather than a life's work mm -hmm. so in in relationships with people i i felt pressured to get to that point of sharing things with people and Viewing it in from this gardening uh, mentality, which I think Jesus gives us the example of that in the parable of the sower, um, you know, to know that my role in someone's salvation may just be some tilling, maybe removing a few rocks from the soil or, you know, breaking up some of that that hard dirt and, and making a place so that when the seed is placed there, it's it's going to have a better chance to grow. But you know, tactics is something anybody can do in their regular interactions with people. It's not um, it's not this pressured approach that I think many Christians grow up or or come to learn that, you know, evangelism is. It's about building relationships with people and it's it's about having the same kind of conversations that you, you know, want to have with people you care about versus, you know, anything that's forced or manipulative in any way. These these are the kind of conversations people love to have. They're the ones that keep you up till 3 a.m. when you're talking with somebody because they're they're intimately listening to what you have to say and you're listening to them and you're understanding how people uh, came to the place they are in life. And And I think it takes that for people to become more open to hearing the gospel. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, we good on I mean, tactics. Yeah. That's basically all I really had to say about it. I just, I was just going to give like a kind of a basic overview of it. And, you know, cause I, I definitely don't, don't want to talk about the book too much because I want people to go out, buy it, read it for themselves. Uh, make sure it contains that little red sticker on it though. Because uh, if you don't, you'll be getting the previous version, which is still good, but uh, it's been updated and expanded with more uh, with more of Greg Kokel's uh, insights and experiences in the last ten years, and some additional tactics to to help as well. So, yeah, I kind of feel like a salesman right now, but uh, but I think the book is is really good. So I think that uh, you know I think anyone should should go out and pick it up. So. Now I don't know about the newest version, but the previous book also uh, comes on Audible. Uh, that's how I read it. I listened to it. Okay. And it is read by Greg Kokel. So if you uh, enjoy okay. Greg Kokel's speaking, mm -hmm. and I do, um, then yeah, it's it's a good resource as well. And yeah. if you're a cheapskate like me, um, and just 
don't feel like reading right now, then go check out Stan to Reason's website. Check out their YouTube. They've got a lot of the material on there. It'll help get you a start. I think the book is the best introduction to things, but you know, feel free to check out those resources as well because they really do go- give a great introduction to the material. And like I said, it's something that's really wide reaching in terms of its application. So, you know, uh, don't hesitate to dive into this. You, you'll you'll find it well worth your time. And yeah. Coco himself has a uh, call in show. Um, he does. And if you listen to it, which re- which you know re airs as a podcast. So if you want to see the tactics in action, right. you know, feel free to check out his show. It's you know he yeah. actually does practice what he preaches, and it's yeah. uh, it's a pleasure to watch him at work. Yeah, in fact, uh, yeah, in fact, some of the examples he uses uh, in his tactics book come from his uh, his Colin shows, as well as other shows that he's done. He talks about an interaction he had with Deepak Chopra, of all people. Uh, so, yeah, so yeah, it's really, really, really good uh, material. So, yep. All right. So my topic today is lying, and this was the subject upon which I cut my apologetics teeth, so to speak. Now that was poorly phrased. <laughs> So let me elaborate on that. <laughs> um, uh, you know how it goes. You're a young, naive little Christian scrolling through the comments section of your favorite podcast when, bam, a specific comment kind of smacks you in the face. It's in all caps, and it begins with the words, hey, Christians. So naturally, what do you do? You read it. That's right. Mm-hmm. And then? Then you use it- tactics. Yeah, well, I didn't read the book back at that time, but uh, so this guy's full comment was, hey, Christians, how come your God is such a liar? Well, it's in all caps, so you know it's true. That's true. It's the unwritten rule of the internet. So if we were using tactics, we would say, well, what do you mean by God and what do you mean by liar? (laughs) You come to the conclusion that God is a liar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the way it's a tactic I took. I, I, I took the bait. Uh, oh, well. And he was ready with a slurry of Bible verses showing uh, all of the lyingness of God. Uh, anybody want to guess which passages they were? Uh, it's fine. Maybe, you don't have to. No, no. I, I, uh, I'll take a. I'll take a swing at it. Maybe the passage where uh, God is interacting with Abraham regarding Sodom and, and Gomorrah. Uh, that, that's not one he gave me. Okay. Gen- uh, Genesis uh, 3, where uh, he tells them they'll surely die if they eat at the tree, but uh, the death isn't instant. You know, that comes up in my uh, presentation here, but no, that's not one of the ones he... I'll, I'll just go ahead and give them to you. Okay. So he hit me with First Kings twenty two twenty three, which says, Now therefore, behold, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of your, these your prophets, and the Lord has spoken evil concerning you. Oh. And Ezekiel fourteen nine, and if the prophet is deceived when he has spoken a thing, I the Lord have deceived that prophet, and I will oh. stretch out my hand upon him and will destroy him from the midst of the, my people Israel. Uh, another one popped into my head that I'm wondering is there uh, the verse from I think it's Philippians where he talks about how in the in the end times he'll put strong delusion in the heads of some people. Bingo! Except that's in Second Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians, okay. But I'll quote the verse. It says, "And for this cause, God will send them a strong delusion, and so that they will believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness." Hmm. All right. So those were the three that he hit me with. At least the three major ones. Um, now, the first step in addressing these is, of course, to put them back in the context instead of just right. letting them float there. Um. So, yeah, I, you you sounded like you had something on that. Did you, you know, want to come back on any of that before I go into it? You're talking to Caleb or me? <laughs> One of you was like, <gasps> as oh, if you were yeah. about to say something. I'm just going to say, yeah, uh, there's a there's a slogan I once heard that a proof text without a context is a pretext. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. I, I hear a lot of different... Uh, who was it? Uh, you know, the, the three rules of interpreting pas- Bible passages is context, context, context. <laughs> right. And then isn't it Kokel that says, don't say, don't quote a Bible verse. Yeah. Yeah. Never quote a Bible verse. I oh, that yeah. Is yeah. 
Right, yeah, because he's really big on context. In fact, uh, he didn't talk about it in tactics, I don't think, but he's talked about how, like, on 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 his show, he'll get someone making some kind of uh, ridiculous claim about Christianity, and he'll quote the one verse, and he'll say, "Okay, well, let's just let's just open it up, let's read it in context, and then even if Greg, even if it's like an obscure verse that, that he hasn't read in you know a year or so, just by uh-huh. looking at it in context, it solves the problem that the uh, atheist is charging Christianity with." Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of these infidel, internet infidels just get on these websites, you know, a hundred problematic Bible verses that are just give like half a verse. And <laughs> right. Yeah. But hey, there are Christians that interpret scripture that way too. So uh, that's true. that's very true. So yeah. All right. Well, let's start with the First Kings passage. Um, so in this passage, it could you know get its own podcast because there's a lot going on in the passage and a lot of history behind it. And, you know, there's potentially a lot to object to in this uh, passage, but let me lay it out for you. Uh, Here you have an instance in Israel's history where the nation is split into two kingdoms. uh, One of, one of which is uh, entirely abandoned the worship of God in favor of other religions. And one of which was only mostly abandoned the worship of God for other religions. (laughs) Uh, so in this passage, the two kingdoms are teaming up to do battle, and they're going through all of their pr- typical pre-battle ceremonies. And one of those ceremonies is to ask all the different prophets of all the different gods to prognosticate the outcome of the battle, sort of a poll the crowd type deal to see what kind of risks there are going into battle. Um, and in this particular instance, all the different prophets are saying the same thing. Uh, that the battle is going to go great and everything will turn up ace- aces. Um, but one of the kings is a little concerned because there isn't a prophet from the traditional Jewish religion, Yahweh worship. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the other king says that he doesn't really like his Yahweh prophet because this guy never says anything nice about him. Yeah. But the other king ex- insists, and they drag the Yahweh prophet into the court. So Yahweh prophet starts all uh, sort of sarcastically telling the king that, hey, go do battle, everything will go great. And the king tells him to cut the crap and be honest. So the prophet (laughs) then starts telling this weird vision he had about God meeting in this angelic court, if you will, some sort of heavenly gathering of spirits and telling them his plan. And God wants the kings to go go up to battle because one of the kings is going to be injured and die in the battle as a punishment for his idolatry. So after telling his plan, God asks for suggestions from the crowd and one of the spirits volunteers to go out into the mouth of all the false prophets and be a lying spirit so that they all convince the kings to go up to battle and God's plan will occur. And so in just just so far, I've counted about, you know, half a dozen things that atheists are going to jump onto and object to in this story. Right. Not least of which is how ridiculous the whole thing sounds. But uh, Anyway, after telling the kids, kings, about his weird vision, the prophet goes on to get curb stomped a bit and then kicked out of the palace. And then the kings go up, do battle, one of them dies, and God's plan is carried out. End of story. Hmm. Now, if I were an atheist, this kind of Bible story is the kind I would love because uh, it's got so many juicy, ridiculous bits, <laughs> um, and there's no end to the sarcastic things I could say about it. Right. Uh, that's among the reasons that I, as an apologist, don't spend a lot of time talking about Old Testament in apologetics because there's a lot of work and very little payoff. Um, ultimately, you know, if Jesus rose from the dead, and that's a point I can defend, then Christianity remains true, no matter what ridiculousness is in the Old Testament. My worldview doesn't prohibit the supernatural things you see in this story, and if the story were to be proven to be entirely fictional, that doesn't destroy a disclaimer I have to put in there because, you know, it's not just Christians that listen to this podcast. <laughs> and, uh, right. you know, I, I don't want to have to go back and pick this story apart bit by bit and <laughs> defend every little bit, as I don't with most of the Old Testament. So right. Right. I'm willing to live with that uncertainty. Hmm. But here, the, mo- the part we're most interested in is the apparent dishonesty or deception specific to the story. Uh, so what are your thoughts, gentlemen, before I get into mine? It, I think one of the problems with this whole concept in general is 
how do you put into words a uh, a time based plan from a uh, timeless being? So I, I think a lot of these problems. Uh, when taking that into consideration, um, clear it up a good bit because, you know, what what does a timeless being's impact on on this? How does that come across to us? Does it come across as as deceptive if if God plans something one way and it seems to to change to us from what we had expected? of God. So I think that, you know, a lot of these things resolve that way for me. Okay. What do you think, Clinton? Yeah, I don't really have anything to add. Uh, I was just, um, I was just kind of fixating a little bit on the fact that like being a prophet was like an actual vocation back in the day. It's like, we've got all these prophets here, you know, but we haven't heard yet from the Yahweh prophet. Go get him and, and let's let's let him uh, voice his, his opinion. And yeah. I just thought that was kind. Of, I just thought that was kind of cool that, that you know. I don't know. So um, yeah, other than that, I don't really have anything relevant to that. I just thought that was a, that was a pretty pretty neat uh, aspect to the, the the account here. And yeah, one one other thought. Um, you know what we see from a Old Testament kind of longitudinal picture as well is. God specifically used the prophets to give some kind of guidance to the people of Israel. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes this guidance was what even today we would consider very crude in some way in terms of, of them living out life in a way that, that would be very satirical Mm -hmm. in terms of its portrayal of, of, you know, a husband and wife relationship actually being representative of Israel and God. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so we see a lot of that lived out as well. So I think when you, particularly with this passage, when you take that in context. uh, So, you know, getting back to this idea about the prophets, what's interesting to me about prophethood is that if you look at the old Testament structure of the sort of theocracy, you had three branches of government. You had the prophet, you had the priest, and you had the king, right? And so, you know, I, I don't need to get into the whole, you know, a schoolhouse rock talk about what each branch of the Hebrew government did. But <laughs> what I will point out is that, you know, your king had to be of the tribe of Judah initially, and then more specifically of the line of David, you know, eventually down the road. Yeah, Caleb there- and I can provide the music for you if you want to do a schoolhouse rock rendition of it. <laughs> No, I'm all right. Uh, I'll I'll write that up and then produce one on my own. That'll be perfect. We'll we'll upload that to the channel later. There we go. Yeah. All right. So yeah, that, you know, so you had the the king had to be of the tribe of Judah and the line of David, um, and then you had the priest, and the priesthood had to be of the tribe of Levi, but the high priest had to be of the line of Aaron and Moses. Um, but then the prophet was a layman. The prophet was chosen by God. It was could be anybody that God just kind of pulled aside and you know said, "Hey, you're a prophet now. Go speak to the king." <laughs> and they were. And that's kind of a cool thing about prophethood is that it was the one branch of this religious government. <laughs> Theocracy. Uh, yes, thank you. Theocracy uh, that was specifically chosen on the spot by God and didn't have to follow from a bloodline. Yeah. All right, well, I'm going to return to this and, well, all of the passage because I think there's a single principle that applies uh, to all of them. So before I do that, let's hit the second one. Um, So in the second one, uh, the Lord is speaking through the prophet Ezekiel, and he's saying that uh, his people in Israel, you know, there are a number of people who are now worshiping idols, and if these idol worshipers were to approach a prophet of God and ask that prophet for a prophecy, God is personally going to embarrass that person as punishment for his arrogance to worship idols and then expect to get a prophecy from God. 
And if the prophet tries to pretend he's gotten a message from God, then God is deliberately going to deceive that person. Mm. Uh, now, this is almost a script for what happened in the previous example that we looked at. Uh, we had an idolatrous king talk with the prophet of God, and the prophet tried to deceive him at first and embarrassed him thereafter. So if nothing else, we've got consistency between two books. Any thoughts on that passage? Which which verse was that again? This is going to be the Ezekiel one. Uh, I'll I'll quote it for you. It says, And if the prophet is deceived when he has spoken a thing, I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet, and I will stretch out my hand upon him, and I will destroy him from the midst of my people Israel. Now, to give you the context, prior to that, it's you know it's talking about how there's these people in idolatry, and that you know they are not to approach a prophet because God will embarrass them essentially. And then it says, but if that prophet tries to speak on my behalf, yeah, you know, and then it leads into this verse, uh, you know, I, the Lord will deceive that prophet or put lying words. And then it says, and if the prophet is deceived, which is this verse, when he's spoken a thing, I, the Lord will deceive that prophet and I will stretch out my hand upon him and will destroy him from the midst of my people. Okay. So everybody with me or. Yeah. Okay. So, so any, uh, any thoughts on that? So, so the, the question then is really, does this make God a liar if he deceives someone who presumes to speak for God who really doesn't? Essentially. Yeah. That's a, that's a good thought. Yeah. So, you know, uh, I mean, there are a couple of ways I could see possibly going and, you know, I'm not a theologian. Um, and sure. I don't know enough, you know, as much about the old Testament as I should. Like I'm familiar with these stories, but, um, you know, uh, in fact, I'm I'm planning on on going through uh, through scripture basically from start to finish, uh, reading it all the way through. You know, uh, from because I don't think I've ever actually read it like start to finish, just individual books. And so uh, I really want to get like a better overview of scripture. And so um, so I'm not as familiar as I probably should be uh, with the Old Testament like I am with the New Testament. Uh, okay. so, you know, a theologian might have a better response than this. A couple, couple of responses I can possibly see is that, uh, number one, um, if God is deceiving a prophet who presumes to speak for, uh, to speak for God who really doesn't, well, that may not actually be an instance of lying, even if it is deception. So you might make a distinction between deception and lying, uh, because, you know, there, there are a lot of people today who would make, who would make an example that, uh, you know, if, if you're back in the Holocaust and you had Jews in your house and the Nazis came to your door asking if you have any Nazis and you say, no, I'm not harboring any Nazis. Well, you've deceived the Nazis, but the question is, have you actually lied to them? Because, you know, they, they don't, they, they don't have, uh, any sort of claim to the truth, and so you don't have an obligation necessarily to speak truth to them. Plus, you're uh, you're abiding by a higher uh, ethical law, which is you know you don't kill or give up innocent people to be killed. So there, so there's that possibility. I can see just just saying that even though God is deceiving, he's not actually lying. Or number two, just to say that God's obligations are not the same as our obligations, because um, you know. Uh, Morality is ground grounded in God's character, and so God is just; He is moral. Uh, but His obligations to us may not be the same kind of obligations that we have to each other. So, if He deceives a human, He may not be uh, be lying in an immoral sense or, or lying at all, really. If you if you think about different obligations, so it might be that God's obligations to us are not the same obligations that we have to each other. Whereas, if 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 I lie to somebody else, that would definitely be immoral that would definitely be a case of lying but if god deceives someone who deserves to be deceived that may not actually be a case of lying because of god's different obligations okay so a couple of ways i can kind of potentially see responding to that okay well uh, a lot of what you just said is going to tie in to some of the things i say so you can give yourself a pat on the back because <laughs> i'll elaborate on, on those a bit all right all right so Last passage uh, is the one from Second Thessalonians, and uh, this is in the New Testament. It's a letter of Paul, and let me put this one in context. So in this passage, Paul is talking about the eventual return of Christ in judgment, and he's laying out a few things they should expect to happen prior to this. Uh, now, in this passage, I think we have the answer that ties all three of these passages together. So uh, let me read. Um, the 
passage, it says, with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Here I think we can, uh, we have the crucial formula that ties everything together. So C.S. Lewis says, quote, there are only two kinds of people in the end, those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says in the end, thy will be done. And I think this is exactly what we happen, we, we see happening in these passages. Uh, consider, in the first passage, we have a couple of idolatrous kings with a bunch of false prophets and one true prophet. The king calls all of the false prophets together and asks their opinion. He has total access to the true prophet, but he chooses the one over the other. At no point does he not have access to the truth. He just chooses the one he liked best. And then he eventually does call the true prophet, and the prophet gives him the truth, but he picks the ones he liked best, and he gets the consequences. In the second passage, we have much the same principle. We have idolaters who are, for the same, some strange reason, asking a prophet of God for a prophecy. And God says in plain words that they aren't going to hear anything true from these prophets because they've chosen to worship idols over God. Again, they have access to the truth, but they choose the truth they like over the one they don't. So God's ultimately just telling them what they want to hear because he told them what they didn't want to hear and they didn't listen. Mm. So he's ceding to their will because they weren't interested in following his will. And finally, in the Thessalonians passage, it spells this out. It says they refuse the truth, they believe the lie, so God eventually gave them the lie that they wanted to hear. So it's a pretty simple formula when you think about it. God makes the truth available, people choose to believe something untrue, and God, who has the power to make them believe truth, doesn't exercise that power and lets them believe what they want. So anyway, that's my take. Any thoughts? I think that uh, that holds up well in terms of looking at other passages in in the Old Testament people struggle with, such as um, the hardening of, of Pharaoh's heart. Um, I think it's really consistent because the, the first couple times it's mentioned that Pharaoh hardens his heart, and then the language changes to say that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. So I, I think it matches up in terms of the pattern you see here and in terms of how it's presented. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that, uh, you know, you see that exact same pattern happening in all three passages. So it isn't just coincidental. It, it taps into some kind of actual truth. Did you want to add to that, uh, Clinton? I think that kind of matched what you said a bit. What do you think? Yeah, it sounded, uh, it sounded pretty similar. Um, you know, and that, uh, uh, you know, yeah, it, what, what I said wasn't necessarily in that, uh, you know, God basically just, uh, you know, allowed them to believe, uh, the lie, which, you know, seems to be implied by the verse, but also that, um, God could very well, uh, uh, say something that's not true to these prophets, have that prophet, uh, give false information and, um, and, you know, I, I, I'm, not sure any any wrongness has been done because uh, God wouldn't have any sort of obligation to tell the truth to that person. So yeah, it, it's pretty pretty mm -hmm. similar. And I, yeah, I think you know you're the one you were talking about uh, seems to be implied by the verse as well. Well, I mean, uh, let's let's say that one of these false prophets comes up and God allows him to prophesy mm -hmm. the truth, right? Mm -hmm. And so at this point, the prophet makes a prophecy. The prophecy comes true, mm -hmm. and who gets the credit? the false God. Now, you know, this, this actually uh, is explicitly stated in the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, Moses gets up there and says that, you know, if a, um, if a prophet comes up and makes a prophecy and the prophecy doesn't come true, then this wasn't uh, <laughs> a prophet of God. And then it's, uh, he says, but if a prophet comes up and makes prophecy and says, Hey, let's, follow other gods, then this wasn't a prophet of God. 
right. you know, and it's, at that point, it even says that God is testing you to see if you love the Lord. Mm. So, yeah, you know, it's a consistent pattern throughout the Old Testament. Right. So I think that you can broaden these the same kind of principle that, you know, God makes the truth available if we choose to pursue something other than the truth. Eventually, God gives us what we want. Yeah. Which is and, and the consequences thereof. Mm-hmm. Um, and we can apply it to these other honesty conundrums that we see. So you had yeah. mentioned the Jews in the attic dilemma, right, Glenn? Yeah. Um, so lies are always a sin, right? But if you have those lives saving lives, like the Nazi at the door uh, deal, um, mm-hmm. is it then a sin? So before I apply the princi- my principle to this dilemma, mm-hmm. uh, what are your thoughts on the, you know, not Nazi at the door, Jew in the attic dilemma. You, you already spoke on this one, Clinton. Did you uh, want to talk to that, Caleb, at all? Well, I'm a magician, so to ask me about deception is uh, <laughs> you're probably going to get a bit of a different perspective anyway. Sure. If if, um, if, if it was you in the situation, you would have made the Jews disappear, right? <laughs> right, right, exactly. Just, yeah, just, for, just for a little while, then they'd right. be back fine. So. Sure, sure, yeah, sure. You lie to people who want to be lied to. <laughs> uh, not all of them, but uh, <laughs> they do afterwards, at least. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I think that I think that our language does not always capture things in kind of the the fullest sense of things. So, you know, we've been using the words truth, lies, deception, um, but none of those words are always uh, black and white, I think, in terms of every application is going to be the same in every scenario. Um, I I would believe that as Christians, given that we are limited by time in terms of how we can view the consequences of a given scenario, we in some capacity have to choose a situational uh, type ethics because we're limited from seeing how the, the butterfly effect impacts those decisions down the road. Mm -hmm. Something you do that is very, very good uh, theoretically has potential to result in something very, very bad and vice versa. So I think that we have to apply some, some trust on God's morality and his character. And we have to act on the best of the information we have in a given situation as to what the, the right and ethical thing is to do. And does that sometimes require deception? I think it absolutely does. And so, you know, that would be kind of my take on it. I think that, you know, the the factor of time is often so underplayed in in these type situations. And that's that's one of the difference that I think makes it so hard for us sometimes to understand you know, why God may do something a certain way when, you know, it wouldn't seem ethical necessarily to us in some sense of the word. But when you view it from the aspects of of his character and his view of reality, you know, maybe, you know, it is the most ethical um, or it would be the most ethical decision to make. Um, in terms of if you're aligning your morality with God's anyway. All right. So my take, uh, the Jew in the attic dilemma has some biblical parallels. Uh, For instance, you have the Egyptian midwives who are lying about killing Jewish babies, and then they're praised as being righteous by virtue of their lies. Um, And then we have a literal Jews in the attic scenario in the book of Joshua, where Lydia hides the Jewish spies in her attic in Jericho and then lies to the guards about it. Um, and Wasn't that Rahab? What's that? Wasn't that Rahab who did that? Did I, did I say Lydia? Yeah. I don't know why the name Lydia is on my mind right now. <laughs> All right, Rahab. Lydia McGrew earlier. Ah, yeah. All right, so Rahab hides the addicts. Yeah, anyway, so yeah, Jew in the attic dilemma. She's hiding these Jewish spies. The guards come around, ask her if she's hiding Jewish spies. She says she isn't hiding Jewish spies when she actually was. You get the idea. Right, yeah. 
So you get this exact dilemma in the Bible, and it seems pretty clearly answered uh, in yeah. that context. Um, so here's the thing I find interesting, um, because it's never really talked about, uh, and that's the ninth commandment. Uh, most people will tell you the ninth commandment is don't lie. But what it actually says is don't bear false witness against your neighbor. So bearing false witness means falsely accusing or falsely acquitting someone in court, basically getting up in the witness stand and saying something that's false. So, you know, the English translation would almost be better. Uh, don't perjure yourself. Um, but it has this idea of accusing someone of something they didn't do. So the focus in the commandment is the administration of justice. Uh, so why is this an important point? It's because everything we talked about up to this point is about justice. Um, it would have been unjust to let the Nazis or the Egyptians or the Jerichoans uh, drag innocent Jews off and murder right. them. So in these instances, truth would have been misused, and the end result would be and it would have been an injustice. And in the other cases, God offered the truth to be just. And the unjust got to believe the falsehoods that they had already endorsed. So it, it kind of separates itself out. People who are pursuing justice end up pursuing truth. People that pursue injustice pursue falsehoods. Um, now, I realize I've just kind of given people license to justify lying to themselves by saying that they were just administering justice or the person didn't deserve the truth or whatnot. To which I would simply respond that God is the ontological foundation of truth. So you and I don't have that kind of authority or privilege. Thoughts? Yeah, I think that fits in well with kind of, you know, some of the things I said. It make it makes sense to me. Um, and particularly from the uh, angle of, of impacting justice, um, if you're, if you're, impacting justice in that way by perjuring yourself against a neighbor. Um, you know, we're looking at, at situations that would have very, very dire consequences as well, especially in, in those times. But even, even today, you know, if someone lies in court against you, then it's, it, it, it could lead to a world, world of trouble. And, so I think it makes a lot of sense that in the in the way you've laid this out for us here, because and it makes sense in terms of the context of these passages as well. And I think it plays right back into the fact that, you know, uh, different circumstances may require actions to to maintain uh, ethical consistency different circumstances may require different behavior. And this, this doesn't mean you should go around lying to everybody to make them feel good. That's, that's certainly not an honest thing either. And I, I would argue that, you know, in most of those situations, even if it's not in a judicial context, you are bearing false, false witness. If you're not um, giving someone the truth uh, if if you know they're asking you about something and you know you choose to to lie about it rather than give them something that may be a little difficult for them to handle, so uh, I think it it makes good sense of the passages while uh, not undermining uh, what we have to do on a on a daily basis. You know something you just said, Caleb, um, brings this to mind. If you think about the structure of the Ten Commandments, the order in which they're laid out. You have, you know, the first eight commandments laying out things that you are not to do. It places boundaries on, um, you know, the people, except for honor your father and mother, which is a positive commandment. It's not something you're not supposed to do. It's something you are supposed to do. And uh, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Okay, yeah, there you go. Uh, two. So at any rate, you, you've got all of these laws laid out, and then the ninth law in the in the uh, section is talking about the court of law. You know, so somebody say steals, which is a plain commandment, that goes to court. Don't commit uh, false witness. So 
you know, don't get up in the witness stand and testify falsely. So, you know, you've got a, a commandment at the end that kind of protects the other commandments in the court of law. You know, so it falls in its natural spot in the commandments because it caps off all of these commandments that, you know, once you go into the court of law, do not accuse others of doing these things that we've just laid out unjustly and don't lie about not doing these things yourself. Uh, so it places the honesty where it belongs in protection of the law, which is interesting to me. It, now, you know, it that's is. nine numbered. Yeah, go ahead. No, I, th- I think you might have been going the same place I was going with number 10. Okay, yeah, number 10 is a fault crime, really. <laughs> it's not something that could be legally enforced because you can't prove or disprove that somebody was um, coveting something. Right. You know, desiring something that they didn't belong to them. You definitely couldn't bring that into a court of law and say, he, he was over there desiring something that belonged to me. You know, that's impossible. So that is an, that's a very interesting commandment because it caps off all 10. And it's the one thing that if you were to be able to follow that particular law, you know, in guarding your thoughts, you could essentially keep the rest of the laws just by doing that. Exactly. Ex- that's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. So, yeah, the structure of the Ten Commandments is brilliant if you take a look at it. But uh, at any rate, that's uh, that's all I had to say about that one. All right. So there's uh, one final bit before I close out my bit on, uh, you know, lying. And uh, all right. So have you ever heard of skeptical theism? Um, I've heard of open theism. No, open (laughs) monotheism. Maybe it maybe it is. Um, is is that anything like essentially believing that uh, theism is true? However, you're you're not sure what deity it is or exactly what its will is. Um, in that regard, so you're kind of just winging it, um, assuming this God exists, but not kind of having any direct revelation from that being. So I don't even know why they call it skeptical theism because it's not quite related to the existence of God or not whatnot. Okay. Skeptical theism is an approach to the problem of evil, and it's one that you've heard William Lane Craig use frequently. It's this idea, you know, we can't show that God doesn't have justified reasons for allowing suffering, and so since we can't show that He doesn't have those, it's an open question as to whether or not, you know, we can complain about the problem of evil because there's a very good uh, possibility that against our ability to suss it out, there are good reasons for suffering. Right. So skeptical theism is just kind of this, you got to leave the door open a little bit that there might be good ends to suffering. There might be something down the road that will come of this that is, that is, that makes the suffering righteous. Okay. Uh, Clinton, you familiar with that? I'm familiar with William Lane Craig's uh, formulation of that. Uh, I didn't, okay, so you know what I'm talking about at the very least. Yeah, I didn't know it had a name, though, skeptical theism, because yep. you know, William Lane Craig is a Molinist, and so I just thought maybe that was what was logically uh, implied by his Molinism. Ah, skeptical theism is the name that they give to that approach, the idea that, you know. So, so it's really more of a theodicy than it is a theological view? or It's not a view about the existence of God. It's a view about, um, you know, the problem of evil, essentially. How to resolve the problem of evil. Yeah. It's an approach. So there's an atheist philosopher. Uh, I can't name who it is. It might have been Peter Boghossian. I don't know. Um, and he, he approaches skeptical theism by saying that if we assume that God has sufficient reasons to allow evil in the world, we must also assume that God has sufficient reasons to deceive us. And consequently, we can't really trust any of this revealed word. And so he gives us an example, the instance uh, where God tells Adam and Eve that the fruit will kill them, and then it doesn't. And then the instance where he tells Abraham to kill his son, knowing that he wouldn't really allow that in the end. Uh, So God misleads and has sufficient reasons to do so, uh, says this guy. Any, uh, Any thoughts on that argument? (laughs) 
I know I'm hitting you with this out of the blue, so I don't expect you to have a comeback. I'm just giving you the opp- opportunity. Yeah, because I think this can kind of uh, go back to our earlier discussion. You know, I, I might respond to this in the same way I responded to the the passage from Ezekiel, in that you know God's obligations to ours are not necessarily the same that we have to each other, and uh, the reason that I've heard uh, that God told Abraham to go sacrifice his son, you know, something I'd always noticed from the passage is, well, you know, Abraham knew that God wasn't going to have him sacrifice Isaac because Abraham told told his, his servants that, you know, both of us will be back. And so I, I always knew that that Abraham knew that God wasn't going to have him go through with it. But one, one reason that I've heard from, uh, from a New Testament scholar, or an Old Testament scholar, rather, was that the reason that that God told Abraham to go sacrifice his son was because he's making a point that God, Yahweh, is not like the pagan gods who require child sacrifices. And so God uh, mm-hmm. told Abraham, you know, you know, don't sacrifice your son. I've got this lamb for you to sacrifice instead. And so that was his way of telling Abraham that he is not a God who is like the, the other pagan gods who requires child sacrifice and things like that. And so that's why, uh, that, that's why, that's the reason that I've heard, theologically speaking, uh, as to why God would do that to Abraham. And so it wasn't necessarily a case of lying, but more like God is making a, a point about, you know, to, to Abraham because, you know, Abraham didn't know Yahweh from the other pagan gods. And so this was kind of a graphic illustration that, that Yahweh was different from the others. Yeah. And I th- it's either Hebrews or uh, one of Paul's epistles. I think it's the book of Hebrews that says that because Abraham had been, pro- this was the promised son um, that, you know, God had told Abraham that he would receive his generations through Isaac that, uh, and that because it took so long for him to have the son. So it was kind of a miraculous, uh, son and so forth that, um, Abraham went to do that with the assumption that God would then raise Isaac from the dead. And this is from the book of Hebrews. This is the Bible interpreting itself. So you've got that going on as well. Well, at any rate, um, yeah, I, I think there are approaches to both the Adam and Eve and the Abraham thing. Um, yeah, actually, uh, on the Adam and Eve thing, uh, I don't know if, if I necessarily agree with this view, but I, I actually did recently hear something regarding that on a book that I'm reading through. Also, is that when God told uh, when t- God told uh, Adam and Eve that on the day they ate of the fruit they would surely die, that God was uh, if you take an old earth approach that God was using the word day in the same way he did in Genesis one, not that on the specific 24 hour period that you eat of it, you will die. But on the day uh, that you eat of it, you will essentially be, uh, you, you will essentially be now on a, on a path leading toward death, something similar to that. And so, uh, and so the, the, interpretation i heard was that uh if you're if you're assuming that god meant on that day you would die uh that basically relies on a faulty interpretation of what of what the word day meant in the original hebrew could be makes a lot of Uh, sense yeah there's uh there's a lot to (laughs) say about that but i'm not gonna do it i've got my whole deal on that but and i think um you know some of this does come down to to trust has God given us sufficient re- reason to believe in his existence? Has he given us sufficient reason to believe that Jesus was his son and was resurrected from the dead? If we have sufficient reason to believe those things, then at the very least, uh, we owe God the trust of it at the very least, what we would give a parent child relationship. Do, do parents always give children the, full truth of a given circumstance? Probably not. They're not always ready for the full truth of a situation. They may get some of the truth, but they may not get the full truth. Is that deception? Some people would probably classify that it is, but just because you're giving information in a way that is attainable to people at a given time um, does not mean that it's, you know, absolutely wrong maybe maybe it really is a situation where you can't handle the full truth of a given situation and you know if if i have good reasons to believe in god's existence and that you know then i can put at least that much trust in uh what he's laid out before me that he's not going to intentionally 
deceive me in a way that's not for my benefit. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that's um, one of the things that you get in the book of Hebrews as well is this idea that, you know, you, you follow God to trust him. And actually that's a cl- clear in the Abraham story because up until the point of the sacrifice of Isaac, God had been coming along and promising the son for years mm-hmm. and had been going through these various, you know, routines of making covenants and uh, so forth with Abraham. So God had been keeping regular correspondence with Abraham on this issue. And then the promise was delivered after a very long period of time. Um, and so there had been this level of trust that had been built at that point as well. So, yeah. Um, in my response to this, this you know, thing that we can't trust God if he, you know, because skeptical theism, um, you know, the first thing I'd say is, so what? Let's assume all of his arguments, which I don't. Uh, it doesn't disprove God, nor does it give us any reason to discard Scripture, uh, even if it reveals, if the revealed word of God could cause us to behave well under false pretenses, as with his examples, it still achieves its ends. You know, we still behave well under false pretenses. Um, but I think we've already answered his argument in the previous portion of the show. I mean, what do we see here? We see a situation in which the truth is made available and designated as obviously being true. And then some attractive lies are also made available. And we have the option to follow what we know to be true or pursue that which we wish to be true. Um, And because God is the ontological foundation of truth, things that come directly from him are by definition true. You know, scripture says that God is not a man that he should lie. Um, you know, incapable of lying, if you will. Um, right. So, in fact, we see this in the first King story, uh, that in order to deceive, God had to go through a very circuitous route and allow a lying spirit to do the deceiving. And we see a similar thing in kind of Job, where, um, you know, God can't be the one that inflicts any kind of harm on Job. He just removes the barriers of protection. Um, and, you know, this is a key word we hear is allow, uh, note that skeptical theism doesn't say that God causes evil for a reason, but that he allows evil for a reason. All right. Well, that closes out my uh, bit on lying. Any final thoughts, gentlemen? I think we we covered a lot of ground. So. I think so, too. All right. Well, you've been listening to The Mentionables. If you like what you hear, give us a five-star review on your podcatcher of your choice. Uh, catch us on all of the social media platforms. Check out our premium content on Patreon. And visit our website at thementionables.org. Thementionables.org. The Mentionables.